Hi, my name's Seth Bauer, and I'm here for a fun reason today, which is to celebrate two of Concord's uh, great passions. One is boats, and one is books. And I have with me uh, two veterans of the world of rowing who got involved with a very unique book about rowing. And uh, we decided to try to put together a, a television show about it. So to my right, my far right, is Bill McLean, who is a Concord resident, who uh, was a member of the 1956 U.S. Olympic crew. He is an Olympic gold medalist as a coxswain. And to his left is John Bigelow, who is also a Concord resident, who is on several U.S. Olympic teams. And uh, we are going to tell the story of both what the connection is between Concord and rowing, and also how they got to uh, bring the boys in the boat to life for audiences all over Massachusetts. Tell me how you got involved in rowing and uh, what brought you to your interest in the boys in the boat? I ended up as part of a uh, diversification program, geographical diversification program for a New England prep school uh, that uh, went looking for kids from the Midwest uh, because they had too many kids from Massachusetts and New York. And uh, the man that went looking for the school happened to be the coxswain of the Harvard 1932 and 1933 varsity cruise, which I didn't know till quite a while after all this happened. Uh, at the time he met me, uh, I was 14 years old. I think I weighed 75 pounds. I now coach novice boys crew at Cambridge Ringe Latin High School in Cambridge. And as a coach, I'm always looking for scrappy little kids as a coxswain. And I think this guy must have seen something in me because I got invited to come back to Exeter. And uh, naturally, we had talked about crew, which I knew absolutely nothing about. I grew up in Kansas City, Missouri. And I got involved in crew simply because I'm a little kid. And I was fortunate enough to make a Exeter Varsity crew in my sophomore year, 1952, uh, a boat that we actually took the Olympic trials in 1952 and got all the way to the semifinals. Wow. So that's how I got started. Uh, eventually matriculated to Yale, which is where we had the gold medal boat. So I had a similar story. I got recruited also as a coxswain uh, after playing tennis at the tennis courts at Yale the summer before I started there as a freshman. And the, one of the assistant rowing coaches was collecting money at the Yale tennis courts. And my dad was trying to see if he could maybe swing a little deal and was saying, you know, my son's gonna be a student here this fall, you know. Is there a student rate? And the guy looked at me, and I was 100 pounds and five foot six, and he said, "There's no student rate, but you have to try out for rowing." <laughs> How about you, John? Uh, I got started in high school uh, on Lake Washington, and uh, my coach and my headmaster of the Lakeside School were uh, rowing. Uh, they were very experienced and successful rowers and passionate about it, so the school supported it. And then when I came to Yale, I uh, continued to row and um, had a very fortunate experience to be there when the Yale crew was turning around and uh, was, I was part of a very strong crew there. And then I sculled afterwards and um, uh, did that for a few years and uh, I was on uh, one Olympic team and a few national teams, and um, then years later I read uh, read this book and it connected very powerfully uh, with me through the Washington Lake Washington connection in Seattle, and uh, so that's what got me in touch with uh, the author and uh, some of the families from the book. So one of the amazing things about this book is that it has taken our the book, The Boys in the Boat, has taken our relatively obscure sport and brought it to millions of people in a whole new way. Um, and uh, there have been a lot of questions about rowing and what it's all about and what it's really like. And John and Bill 
um, have put together a, a conversation, a, a presentation about it that they have been bringing to libraries and audiences uh, all over the region. And so um, we're going to launch right into telling that story of your experience with the boys in the boat and what was happening in that book and how much of it relates to what you did and Bill, how much relates to, I mean, the 56 Olympics was not all that much later. Um, very much the same kind of generation and times. Uh, and so, um, John, why don't you tell us a little bit? So I uh, contacted Daniel James Brown through his website and he put me in touch with Judy Rance. And it's really uh, fun to hear her story for how uh, Daniel James Brown learned about this and got connected with her father. Um, her father had to sell his house in 2004 and, and moved in with Judy and just happened to be neighbors with Daniel James Brown. Daniel James Brown was an author at Microsoft. He was trying his hand at writing books and he wrote a book called Under a Flaming Sky and he encouraged his neighbors to read it. And Judy was trying to get her dad's story uh, and learn more about it from him and was trying to figure out if it would make a book. And so she eventually read Daniel James Brown's book and, and uh, encouraged him. And he was very enthusiastic and eventually came to meet uh, Joe Rance before he died. Fortunately, uh, they had a few months together with some interviews. And um, he made this great book out of it. Um, and one of the most poignant uh, lines, which is in the book, is, uh, can I write a book about you? And Joe says, no, you can write a book about the boat. And then Judy shared uh, family photos with me and um, a little bit more color uh, to the story. So there's some things in the in the story that you know that didn't make the book, huh? Oh yeah, there's a lot of uh, fun, well just even photographs of um, Squim and the upbringing, uh, family photos that they found in, in uh, Joe's attic. And uh, there's another story example of a story um, that when Judy was reading Daniel's first book, Under a Flaming Sky, it's a story about the Midwest, and um, Joe was saying, I know one of those guys in the book. His name is Angus Hay, and I know him. I went to school with him, and Judy says to herself, well, it can't be, it can't be, but he kept insisting, and Daniel James Brown said, I think he moved to Squim in Washington State, and so it would have been his son that Joe went to school with, which was a real coincidence. And how big a town was Squim Squim's in Washington tiny, State? Tiny, tiny back in those days. Some of the, some of the photos you can see uh, show how small it is and how... Uh, um, and then, of course, it's described in the book as well. Um, very small town. So we've talked a little bit about how we got involved in rowing. How did Joe Rance, the sort of main character in The Boys in the Boat, get involved? As rowing does, it appeals to interesting people who are a little eccentric, and uh, Joe just uh, didn't row before he went to the University of Washington, and um, uh, he was drawn along with a number of other, the, uh, actually the same boys in his boat, um, mostly from families that were adversely impacted by the Depression. Um, and uh, and it, it worked for him, and uh, it was a hard, uh, hard fit and uh, well-fought battle. But uh, the coach finally got it right. Sometimes you can't tell, um, and you just can't. Uh, eventually, once you see it, you can't undo it. It's too fast. How do you know when a boat's right? When you have the right lineup? Seth, you've been a coxswain. It's all in the seat of the pants. We describe it as swing. Um, the oarsmen describe it as the boat, when it's going well, tends to float up on top of the water. And they tell me that it's like you can't pull hard enough and it flies. We, did, we talk about the boat flying. Right. I think it's the toughest job a coach has. I mean, he has to, he has to teach rowing, the technique of rowing he has to do. He's responsible for the conditioning of his crew. The most important task he has is to take a group of men and fit them together in a boat that works. That's a unique skill. My coach had it. I'm sure your coach had it. Uh, that's what coaches of fast crews are able to do. 
and how that works is a little bit of magic. So John, how, do you want to talk about the Washington program at the time of the boys in the boat? Uh, sure. It was uh, in its early stages. Um, when the boys in the boat was taking place was 1936, and that was just after World War I, and there was a big airplane hangar, a seaplane hangar, that had been built on the campus that was then never used and it was abandoned by the military and given to the University of Washington and they used that for a boathouse and fortuitously um, also on the top floor it was used for building Pocock boats so they had the advantage of having a, a really wise uh, coach available to them who was a boat builder in George Pocock upstairs and um, who figured prominently in uh, th those boys, uh, not only their rowing, but also uh, as a good role model. I thought that was one of the amazing things about the book, was the description of the boat building process and, and uh, the sort of love for the boats themselves. The boats nowadays are not like that. Uh, they're getting very expensive these days. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, I don't think I've heard of a wooden boat making uh, the world championships in many years. But they were beautiful, beautiful boats. What was unusual uh, back then, as opposed to these days, is that the whole team was selected from a college to go represent the whole country. And uh, I can give you some uh, a little color stories uh, about each rower in the boat. Roger Morris uh, was the bowman, and his family was in the moving business. It was hurt by the Depression, and um, he had to earn his tuition money uh, playing in a dance band. Um, and Ch Chuck Day was the two-seat. Um, he came from a slightly more wealthy family. His father was a dentist. Um, but in spite of that, he wanted to go work on the Grand Coulee Dam in the summer. And that was a really rough job. And it showed uh, how he didn't shy down, shy from a challenge. Um, the three-seat was Gordy Adam and he worked on a dairy farm and uh, salmon fishing in the summer. And um, tried playing football and then uh, didn't like it and came out for rowing and uh, it worked, was a good fit. Number four was Johnny White. His father wanted him to row. So he came out after heavy labor on the docks and in the lumber yards around Seattle area. And uh, that was good preparation for, his, uh, for rowing actually for him. Um, number five, his name was Jim Stubb McMillan, and he uh, couldn't play a sport in high school. He had to uh, do odd jobs, um, but as he was mowing the lawns and raking leaves and weeding gardens uh, around the Seattle area, he would see uh, the crews out on the lake and, and was drawn to the sport. Um, number six was Shorty Hunt. He was the youngest boy on the team and celebrated his 19th birthday uh, on opening day, opening ceremonies in Germany. And uh, Joe Rance is uh, described in the book, grew up in Squim, spent a lot of his childhood alone, uh, which is very moving uh, story, as well described in the book. And the stroke was Don Hume. Um, and I like this story. Um, his family was up in Bellingham in um, lumber mills. And his father lost his job and took a new job in Olympia, which was a long way south. And um, Don stayed up there to finish his job. And eventually, when that wound up, he ended up uh, figuring out a way to get down to his family by, he had found a, a rowboat on the shore and he refurbished it and rowed it down to his family. It was a six day trip and about 100 miles. And uh, that um, probably showed the seeds of a future Olympic stroke. So Bobby Mock was the coxswain and uh, his father was the town jeweler and watchmaker and his story is funny that he was, um, coxswains are small and short and he was... Oh um, really? He was... <laughs> 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 no offense. He was uh, asthmatic as a kid and he was topped out at five foot seven and he, his favorite sport and he was good at it in high school was basketball and he lettered in it. <laughs> So that was a fun story about how good of an athlete um, he was. And, and uh, he also had a Jewish heritage, and he didn't know it until he was going to Germany to compete in the Olympics. That's the boat. They were all Washington State, mostly from around Seattle, and uh, 
mostly affected by the depression, hard working, uh, poor families, and that's what makes it such a great story. And um, and they had the swing that Bill was talking about earlier. They clearly had the swing, and uh, it made me envious to read it. Hmm. Uh, wishing I had been there. Having commented on the size of coxswains, you're obviously at the other end of the size scale. Uh, how big are you, and how does that compare to the, the guys who are in this crew? I was six foot three, about 185 in my uh, top form when I was racing, and uh, the best rowers these days are usually bigger than that. And um, these guys were actually a small group. Um, their height and weight, um, their roster from the uh, IRAs uh, is a uh, slide that I got from Judy Rance, shows that they were slightly smaller and less uh, and, and lighter than uh, the current, for example, Yale varsity heavyweight or our national team uh, tend to be pretty tall, six foot four to six foot six, 200 plus pounds, wouldn't you say? And these guys were 175, 171, uh, maybe a few of them in the 180s, but nobody over that, and six foot two to six foot four. And, um, but uh, lean and mean is a, uh, adjectives that are used for good rowing teams. They were clearly that. So one of the things that I thought the book, uh, The Boys in the Boat, did extremely well was describe rowing and the experience and the training and, uh, you know, despite the fact that the author had never participated in, in the sport himself. And, and I thought he did a great job. But there's still more to the story. So uh, from your perspective, how would you describe the intensity of the physical effort that it takes to, to move a boat at this kind of speed, at this kind of level, this kind of competition? I connect and I identify with how much time they spent on the water and how they rode in the winter and how they rode in the waves and the cold. And there is uh, on one level, there's a lot of discomfort that you have to go through. And it's worse for a coxswain who just can't be moving. If you're cold and rainy and wet and you're just stuck sitting, uh, your motion is just going to be steering, And whereas the rowers can exercise and get warm. Uh, but still, the rowers are going to bang a wave. Your knuckles are going to hit the gunnel and start to bleed. And nobody's going to cry for you. Nobody's going to say, oh, can I come and put a Band-Aid on and let me, let's take care of that for you before we take another stroke. You just get used to it. And uh, it's cold. Your fingers get numb. And uh, that's separate from the discomfort you feel of getting in shape. And uh, that would include a, a learning how to improve your endurance, which takes a lot of work. Uh, um, at the level, we now call it the anaerobic threshold level, where you get a burn and uh, you're actually stimulating your body to uh, develop new blood vessels in the muscle and, and grow more mitochondria, not to mention the weight training. And the weight training creates a burn that's very painful, and if it simulates a rowing race, it's an intense burn, and you have to keep every thing in your body wants to tell you to stop because it's so painful. Uh, and you just have to learn to push through it. Um, John, the legend was that you didn't feel pain the same way that other rowers did, and that's why you could outperform people. I've, uh, I can't know that. I, I don't know what other people were feeling. I think I was blessed with uh, um, some aspects of my physiology that allowed me to reach a level. But there were times when uh, I had some races that were very painful indeed, and uh, they're memorable. So Bill, in your boat, was there anyone with that reputation? Someone who could take the pain better than, better than most? I, we never talked about pain. I've rowed in a lot of boats. I've been involved in the sport for 65 years now. That's a good start. That's a good start. Um, there's a lot of pain in uh, six minutes of rowing uh, to total exhaustion, in fact. Uh, in fact, our three man basically passed out about 50 meters from every finish. Uh, and in fact, after the Olympics, they had to haul him off to the hospital to hmm. 
recover him. So uh, a lot of pain. But as John says, the rowers learn how to push through it. Uh, it's, it's, it's not a subject we spend a lot of time talking about. I find it interesting because if you watch a video of the boat, um, and uh, because of the boys in the boat, we've been amazingly lucky to actually unearth some video, even by the uh, uh, German uh, propaganda video artist, uh, Lenny Reifenstahl, correct? Um, if you watch a boat row, it looks very graceful. It looks very easy. It looks like uh, it doesn't take a lot of effort to do that. <laughs> And from the inside, the amount of effort is unimaginable. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's kind of the, probably the biggest dichotomy of the sport is seeing it from the outside and then understanding it from the inside. There's actually a really good clip of, uh, that, that Judy Rance shared with me of the finals of the r trials for the 1936-8. And that is real, that's the real boat, and they do look smooth and beautiful and the water's very calm. Lenny Reifenstahl's clip from Germany, which uh, I also uh, show in the, in the, when I share this uh, with other audiences, is staged. And what uh, people don't realize is she came back the day after the Olympic uh, finals and she filmed again and put the camera, cameras back then were big, um, she put them in the boat and staged the, uh, the uh, race. As it was a GoPro. It was like a GoPro, <laughs> a big GoPro. Yeah. So uh, hers is not quite as, um, it doesn't look quite as uh, real. There, there is some real, she, she mixed in the, the real Olympic finals with some of the, the uh, filming she did the next day. But it's not quite as uh, beautiful as uh, you might expect. They were also rowing in rough water. What, what did they have to do in order to make the Olympics? What was the, what was the qualification? Uh, well, they came back. They, they were on the West Coast, and uh, rowing was very popular back then. They got a lot of publicity. But the, to race the rest of the crews in the country, they had to make a trip back east. And uh, so they raced California a lot out there, and that was a big rivalry. Then they came back and uh, had to race against the most... Um, elite schools on the East Coast, which rowing had been uh, tradition for more years, and um, they were more um, practiced at it. So they, the first race they go to is the IRAs, which back then was in uh, New York, and it was on a river, and it was four miles long. And they had a good show there. They won the race coming from behind, um, but that didn't qualify them. They, they had to go to uh, the Olympic trials on Princeton, uh, Lake Carnegie in Princeton, and uh, and win again, and um, which they did, and that was I can't remember exactly how long after the uh, IRAs that was. It would have been probably one or two weeks, and they won, and um, that's all they had to do. But there was another catch in the book that uh, the second place crew, uh, the the coach said, well now you have to pay to go to the Olympics. You have to pay your travel. So that's a good story in the book about how they came up with the money for that. So Bill, in your, you, you had to go through a similar trials, right? When, yes, yes, yes. When did you know you were going to the Olympics? Like what was that moment where you're in the trials, you're racing, it's how many boats across? The trials, there were uh, four, uh, six boats in our final. Mm -hmm. I knew we were going to win the trials 20 strokes after the start. There's a long story behind this. Cornell was our major competitor at the time. We had lost a 2,000 meter race to Cornell. We lost the Eastern Sprints to Cornell, and that made them the odds on favorite to go to the Olympics. We lost that race because of a crab that one of our rowers caught in the last 10 strokes. We were ahead. Cornell beat us by six feet because our crab basically stopped the boat. And when we went to uh, Syracuse for the Olympic trials, I'm sure in the minds of the Cornell crew, they thought they had sprinted past us in the last 20 strokes of the race. We knew a lot better. Right. We knew we had won the race and screwed it up. That was the psychological setting 
for the finals of the Olympic trials. Three strokes into our start in the Olympic trials, our stroke caught a crab. Short one, recovered. Five strokes after that, the seven man caught a crab over the head, lost the oar into the lap of the six man. Essie shoved it back, the seven man got the oar, we got going again. Into 20 strokes, we did our saddle. And I looked around. We were even with Cornell. And I said, guys, we're going to the Olympics. <laughs> and we ended up beating them by three quarters of a length. We uh, settled and rode right away from them for the whole race. That's when I knew. <laughs> John, when did you know you were going to the Olympics? What, was you, what, what did you have to do to qualify? Uh, this was in 1984. Yeah, that's an interesting story, Seth. Um, and uh, I had uh, been wrestling with a back injury that actually, uh, I, I was the single in 81 and 82, and I was about six or seven seconds ahead of the next best guy, Tiff Wood. And then in 83, uh, he was about six or seven seconds ahead of me, so I spent the year rowing a double with Paul Enquist, who later went on to become an Olympic gold medalist in the double. Uh, Paul and I trained in Lake Washington and then I came back and we raced back east and we were the fastest double um, and fortunately or unfortunately depending on how you look at it I then won the singles trials but it was a surprise I barely beat Brad Lewis uh, it was a photo finish and uh, the judges had to debate about it and and uh, so I got to represent the US as a single sculler so your photo finish is like the photo finish in The Boys in the Boat? Yes, it's a good picture. Uh, uh, they came from behind, and I guess I did too. So you actually didn't even know whether you were going to the Olympics after you finished the race? I sat on the water for a while before I found out, yeah. Wow. And the finish line in Princeton where I raced, was uh, at, it felt like it was at an angle, so it's hard to read. So do you have a sense of... Um, the rowing enthusiasm in Concord. I want to just bring it back well, it's to, to this community and uh, the fact that people who have led these outs done these outstanding things uh, are all around you in Concord. Yeah, and Concord's a, in some, a lot of ways, Concord's a private place, and there's a lot of people here who are very special that are not uh, necessarily recognized. Um, I met a uh, walking past my house, a uh, Harvard seven man that used to be a, a big problem for us when we were in college. <laughs> <laughs> and here he is in Concord. And uh, rowing's an old sport too. It's in a lot of families in, in ways that you don't expect because rowing's not a stardom sport. You don't uh, stand out as an individual. Um, the other fun thing is Ted Van Dusen's shop is right here in Concord, and he's made boats that have gone to many Olympics, uh, for at least for U.S. rowers. And um, Ann Martin grew up here. She's another uh, multiple Olympic uh, single scholar. And, uh, and Tom Bohr. Tom Bohr. C.B. Sands. Yep. So it's a town of unsung heroes. Oh. And, uh, All rowers are unsung heroes. That's true. Seth. <laughs> and uh, we're actually uh, going to make some of those connections and, and try to do some further shows about rowing and Concord and uh, the boys in the boat. And thanks for watching.